everybody let's worship the Lord together
us, Lord. Thank you for the sacrifice that you made, that you made the way that we can come to you, that we can come to the Father, Lord. We thank you for this evening, this time of worship we get to celebrate and lift up song and praise to you, Lord, for you are holy and you are worthy. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's say hello to one another.
was a Took my place, laid inside my tomb of sin. You were buried for three days, but then you walked right out again. And now death has no sting, and life has no end. For I have been transformed by the blood.
glory to your name, Lord. You know, there is no other name, no other name that brings salvation that we can call on to you, Lord. Thank you that we get to freely call your name. Lord, be blessed by our worship, I pray. And speak to us through your word, I pray. In your name I pray, amen. Amen. All right. All right. Thank you, Jesus. Blood applied. Whoa. Amen. We're going to be in Ezekiel chapter 44 tonight. Right in the heart of prophecy. It's awesome. Men's study tomorrow morning, guys. If you're not doing anything and you want to join the guys and be in the Word, so we should study every single day of the week, man. <clears throat> Thursday uh, is Thanksgiving. If you're not doing anything, come join us. Let me know if you want to come. It's either going to be at our house or it'll be here, depending on how many people come. But either way, the last two years we had it here, and so we just kind of transformed that outer area into our house. And so made it a little more homey. But um, we just got to know how many turkeys to cook. So let us know if you want to come, if you want to join in. That'd be a blessing. Uh, Wednesday night we'll have Bible study as always and Friday so plenty of opportunity to get in the word Lord thank you for your word thank you God as we open up to Ezekiel here and uh, God just look into the future Lord we gotta what the world longs for God they want to know what's coming they want a crystal ball Lord this isn't a crystal ball this is just the truth and you give us Lord, it, it just a glimpse into the future so that we know how to conduct our lives now, Lord, so that we can <clears throat> be living appropriately and in accordance with what is coming, God, now. And if I don't, I'm a fool, Lord. But God, in light of this, uh, what exciting things await, Lord. And you're bringing it all to pass. Already the things you have told us are going to come are coming to pass, Lord. So not like it's just some far-fetched idea lord you told us what to expect in anticipation of what is coming and we're seeing that all around us so god please cause your word to dwell richly within us and uh bless your word to our hearts in jesus name amen <clears throat> all right well we're gonna study chapter 44 let's set, set the context we'll uh turn to chapter 40 <clears throat> real quick to throw you off a little bit. <clears throat> this is where this lengthy prophecy began. So just to put it in remembrance, it says in verse 1 of chapter 40, in the 25th year of our captivity, at the beginning of the year, on the 10th day of the month, in the 14th year after the city was captured, on the very same day, the hand of the Lord was upon me, and he took me there to that city, that city that was captured, Jerusalem. In the visions of God, he took me into the land of Israel, set me on a very high mountain. On it toward the south was something like the structure of a city. This prophecy was given to the nation of Israel after they had been taken into Babylonian captivity. The prophet Ezekiel was taken in this vision to the future day when Israel will be restored as a nation with the glory of the Lord dwelling amongst them once again, as it was in the days of Moses and in the days of Solomon. So this is yet to happen, but everything that the Bible describes as leading up to this is all falling into place very quickly. It's amazing how things are going. You know, we have a, a trip planned to Israel. I don't know if that's going to happen. You know, I mean, I don't know if we're going to fly into a war zone, if we can even do so. Maybe we will, maybe we won't. In the meantime, and Brian will share some more of this on Sunday, you know, we work with a, a, a organization there that helps fund the nation of Israel. We've worked with them, and they are actually um, having people come over and help uh, bring in their harvest there because all the people who work on the farms are in the, ba are in the battle. So 
that's something that excites you, you know. Like I said, Brian will share some more of that on Sunday. That's, you know, the type of situation that's going on in Israel right now where, you know, they're, they're petitioning for people to come and help bring in their crops because the people have all been called to fight in this war. So you, know, you see that happening. You see um, my, my daughter-in-law, her, her mom's going to be flying. They're all concerned because there's a volcano about to erupt in Iceland. And that's not the only one. There's another one that's going to be, you know, maybe erupting. I mean, only a couple thousand earthquakes. So, you know, it's a kind of a sign. And if that erupts, it's going to hinder travel plans. And you're just living with those things, you know, you can go down the list of things that are in the news every single day right now and you, you kind of just get numb to it and you go, yeah, it's just another day, another war, another earthquake, another tsunami here. And yet those are the things that are happening. And we're taken out here into beyond that. As more prophetic scripture has been given from the time of Ezekiel, it's been revealed that Ezekiel's vision here pertains to the coming age that will be ushered in by seven years of tribulation, as it's called, followed by a thousand years of the Lord Jesus Christ ruling and reigning upon the earth. I can't wait. What a day that will be. What Ezekiel has shown here in great detail in these last uh, ten chapters, eight chapters, whatever they are, of, of his book, is this holy, uh, uh, this holy mountain in the land of Israel, verse 2, having something like the structure of a city, on top of it that will uh, uh, exist during that thousand year reign of Christ. And as the prophecy began, we saw in chapters 40 through 42 that Ezekiel was given precise measurements. He was given a tour guide basically to bring him around. They measured the whole place, not only the city, but then also the central feature within the city, which is a large worship center with a brand new temple right in the center of it. After measuring all the dimensions there in chapters 40 through 42 and chapter 43 that we saw last time, Ezekiel saw the return of the glory of the Lord, the Shekinah glory that had departed from the temple Solomon built just shortly before it was destroyed in Ezekiel's day. Ezekiel was given a glimpse of God's return to dwell amongst his people in that future day and he was to share this with the people that were living there in a prisoner of war camp. I mean, how merciful for God to reveal this to them in the midst of self-inflicted judgment. You know, he's not condemning them. He's not saying, you know, you got what you deserve. You know? He's saying, here, let me show what the future holds. Such a merciful God. He says the same thing to you and I in my times of failure and just falling short, and I read specific prophecies because we've been given a lot of insight into what is in store for us as a church. And during my times of trial and hardship, I get encouraged by reading those prophecies, knowing where they are, and going, God, thank you that this world, this present time is not all that there is. Now, we as the church, we're going to have an active role to play during this coming kingdom age for a thousand years as a Lord's spiritual bride. That's something we're being prepared for presently. It's why we do the things we do. We seek to just try and, you know, uh, just conduct ourselves here at this church in a way that is in line with the, what the Lord told us to be preparing for. You read his kingdom parables. And Jesus alludes to the opportunities that await us. Then when, you know, if I'm a faithful servant now, there's a lot of opportunities that are to come. A lot of people are going to be missing out you know, on everything that we have the privilege of, of entering into when we go to this kingdom, when we're in this kingdom. But here in Ezekiel, we're seeing the role that Israel will have. Speaking to Israel after seeing the return of God's presence back to this earthly temple, chapter 43 gave a description of the consecration that will be involved in preparing the altar of sacrifice. Now as we pick up with chapter 44 tonight, Ezekiel is brought out from inside the temple. He's brought out of the temple area or the sanctuary as it's called. And he's brought to the gateway leading into the temple area 
where he had seen the glory of the Lord enter in chapter 43. And it says, chapter 44, verse 1, Then he brought me back to the outer gate of the sanctuary, which faces toward the east, but it was shut. And the Lord said to me, This gate shall be shut, it shall not be opened, and no man shall enter by it, because the Lord God of Israel has entered by it. Therefore, it shall be shut. Now, as we'll see, there are two other gateways into the temple area, one on the north, one on the south, by which the worshipers of that day will enter and exit. But this main eastern gate that would go right directly into it will not be used again. It is shut, verse 1 says, and no man shall access the temple area by it ever again because the Lord God of Israel entered by it, verse 2 says. So it's shut for two reasons. First, to symbolically emphasize God's holiness. This gate is the gate that God came through. No one else is now allowed to go through it. God came through this. And secondly, the gate being shut emphasizes God's permanence. He's not going to depart. He's entered and the gate is shut as a way of proclaiming that he will not be leaving the presence of his people again. Now, once again, how merciful and how encouraging this would be as somebody sitting in a concentration camp there in, in what is modern-day Iraq in Babylon, and they're hearing this prophecy, God encouraging his people. Verse 3, and as for the prince, because he is the prince, he may sit in it to eat bread before the Lord. He shall enter by way of the vestibule of the gateway and go out the same way. Now, the prince here is speaking of a resurrected, glorified King David, as we'll see in a minute. But the various roles and the, the, the different people and entities will fill during the kingdom age are just taken for granted. So the roles that, you know, people like this, you just kind of plopped in there. It doesn't give any real explanation. But the roles that different people, different entities are going to fill during the kingdom age are just taken for granted in prophetic scripture. You have to pull all the biblical information together in order to get the full picture. We know from the New Testament that Jesus Christ will return to earth and establish his sovereign authority over the whole earth. Amen. You see that in Revelation 19, Revelation 20. But that is also seen in scriptures like Psalm 2, Isaiah 9, Jeremiah 33, and many others, all of which depict the Messiah ruling over the whole earth that will consist of Jews and Gentiles once again. There will be that separation. But the thousand-year reign of Christ will also be an age when resurrected saints from the Old Testament, resurrected saints from this present church age as well as those who get saved during the seven-year tribulation period. Saints from all three ages will be resurrected and will be dwelling and serving in glorified bodies alongside this growing population of people in natural bodies during that age a thousand years, with certain Old Testament saints ruling and reigning over Israel under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. Israel will be a growing nation in that day. The glorified church will be ruling and reigning with the Lord over Gentile nations on the earth. And glorified tribulation saints, they are not the church, they are not Old Testament saints, but the book of Revelation describes them as being resurrected, glorified as well during the thousand-year reign of Christ and having some position of authority over an earth that will be rapidly being repopulated. Israel will have a place of prominence here in this holy mountain that Ezekiel is shown and the surrounding area. Israel as a nation, they're going to shine as look at what God has done through all these thousands of years during this, these present ages at this time. But there's one specific glorified saint from their past history who's given this position there in the worship temple. It's referred to here simply as the prince. 
That's not the guy in the purple suit from Minneapolis, you know, with the weird looking guitar. But this is a glorified King David. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 9. We'll just look at Jeremiah 30 and up to verse 9, 1 through 9. If you're in the New Testament, you went the wrong direction, turn around. It's about just give some that are nearby where we're studying tonight. Jeremiah 30. This as well as is, is a lengthy prophecy. So I'm just kind of dropping into the midst of it. I encourage you to study these because they're fascinating. But it says in verse 1 of Jeremiah 30, The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus speaks the Lord God of Israel, saying, Write in a book for yourself all the words I have spoken to you. For behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will bring back from captivity my people Israel and Judah, says the Lord. And I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers. They shall possess it. Now these are the words that the Lord spoke concerning Israel and Judah. For thus says the Lord, we have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, not of peace. Ask now and see whether a man is ever in labor with child. So why do I see every man with his hands on his loins like a woman in labor? Remember Jesus referring to the days leading up to the kingdom age as the, uh, the, like labor pains. This is where he gets the, these references from. All the faces turn, turn pale, for alas, the day is great, so that none is like it. It is the time of Jacob's trouble. It's another name for the tribulation period in the Old Testament, Jacob's trouble, because Israel will be at the center of that tribulation period. It's a refining of the nation of Israel. But he, as it says here, Jacob or Israel will be saved out of it. For it shall come to pass... In that day, says the Lord, I will break his yoke from your neck and will burst your bonds. Foreigners shall no more enslave them. So here comes the, the kingdom age, and they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up for them. So this is part of a, a lengthy prophecy again. Here incorporates the new covenant that Israel will come under during that kingdom age, but there's this reference to King David. Now turn to Ezekiel chapter 34. Again, this is a lengthy prophecy. We went through several chapters. The context of this prophecy is the future day when God will be the, the good shepherd over Israel, something Jesus Christ claimed himself to be. And the religious leaders got pretty upset when he said, I am the good shepherd. But you look at verse 11. For thus says the Lord God, indeed, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock on the day he is among his scattered sheep, so will I seek out my sheep, deliver them from all the places where they were scattered on a cloudy and dark day. And I will bring them out from the peoples, the goyim or the nations, gather them from the countries, will bring them to their own land. See, all these things we're seeing are taking place, has taken place. I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, in the valleys, in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them in good pasture, and their fold shall be on the high mountains of Israel. There they shall lie down in good fold and feed in the rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock. I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek what was lost, bring back what was driven away, bind up the broken, strengthen what was sick, but I will destroy the fat, the strong, and feed them with judgment. Now drop down to verse 20. Same context, therefore thus says the Lord God to them, behold, I myself will judge between the fat and the lean sheep. So this is when they've all been gathered together. Because you have pushed with side and shoulder, butted all the weak ones with your horns, scattered them abroad. Therefore, I will save my flock, and they shall no longer be a prey, and I will judge between sheep and sheep. I will establish one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them, my servant David. 
He shall feed them and be their shepherd, and I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David, a prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. So once again, clear reference to King David as having a role in the coming kingdom as a prince. Now turn a few pages to chapter 37. It's actually part of the same prophecy. You pick up at verse 24 of chapter 37. It says, David, my servant, shall be king over them. They shall all have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. Then they shall dwell in the land that I have given to Jacob, my servant, where your fathers dwelt. And they shall dwell there, they, their children, their children's children forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. So there's few, just a few references that identify who is being spoken of. Back in chapter 44, you go back there where it says in verse 3, As for the prince, because he is a prince, the, because he is the prince, he may sit in it. This is speaking of this gate that was shut. He may sit in it to eat bread before the Lord. He shall enter by way of the vestibule or of the gateway and go out the same way. So the prince, identified as a resurrected, glorified King David, he will be able to enter this shut gate. But only from the inside is what's being described here. The outside is closed, but he will enter in. Remember the gate is kind of a long, narrow passageway. King David will be eating bread, it says. It's referring to some sort of sacrificial meal. So it will be an interesting time, to say the least. If you are there, and I'm sure most of us will be if you're saved, if you want to meet King David, you'll know where to find him, okay? He'll be in this gate eating some bread. Now, there's an interesting prefigure of this in 2 Samuel chapter 19. And David comes back to the city of Jerusalem after the death of his son Absalom. He was overcome with grief, but then Joab said, you got to come out, everybody's you know, upset now that you're upset. And so it says there in 2 Samuel 19, 8, the king arose and sat in the gate, and they told the people, there is the king sitting in the gate. So all the people came before the king, for everyone of Israel had fled to his tent. And so it's an interesting prefigure of what you see here. Here is that same King David. Now he's called the prince because Jesus is the ultimate ruler here. But he'll be sitting eating just these little, you know, insights. Like I said, they're just thrown in there like, you know, just this is how it's going to be. And a lot of times given no extra, you know, information. Just you got to kind of pull the different things together. Now, verse 4 also he brought me by way of the north gate to the front of the temple. So I looked, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord, and I fell on my face. And the Lord said to me, Son of man, mark well, see with your eyes, hear with your ears, all that I say to you concerning all the ordinances of the house of the Lord and all its laws. Mark well who may enter the house and all who go out from the sanctuary. Now say to the rebellious, to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, O house of Israel, let us have no more of your abominations. When you brought in foreigners, uncircumcised in heart, uncircumcised in flesh, to be in my sanctuary, to defile it, my house, and when you offered my food, the fat and the blood, when they broke my covenant because of all your abominations, and you have not kept charge of my holy things, but you have set others to keep charge of my sanctuary for you. Thus says the Lord God, no foreigner uncircumcised in heart or uncircumcised in flesh shall enter my sanctuary, including any foreigner who is among the children of Israel. Now having pictured for us the privileged place of the prince, he's portrayed as a kind of overseer, of this worship center that will be existing in that future day. Now there's insight given into the place that foreigners, Levites, priests are going to have or not going to have with regards to this future temple and the service that's conducted within it. So, you know, 
there's no reason why when I'm serving the Lord in this day, I, I shouldn't have any, you know, I shouldn't have all understanding of everything that's going on here because he's told me what's happening. I should know this is why this person's here. This is why that's taking place. You know, I mean, a lot of people could care less. But personally, I'm like, I'm studying up on these things because I plan on having an active role here doing something if he lets me clean the closets or sweep the hallways i'm good with that but i will know what's taking place and he's giving us the idea here now here's what pertains to these foreigners and levites and this is why or why not they're going to be you know serving in the way they are ezekiel having been given insight regarding the eastern gate david's place there He's taken now, verse 4, by way of the north gate. So he's taken around back into the courtyard that's right around the, the temple itself, right to the front of the temple, verse 4. So, so Ezekiel's getting around here. He's, he's making the rounds. The glory of the Lord filled the temple, it says, and Ezekiel fell on his face there in verse 4. That is the natural reaction of anyone who beholds the glory of the Lord. Now, these people, they say, you know, they went to heaven and talked to Jesus and all these things. Too. Every time someone in the Bible beholds the glory of the Lord, they are on their face. It shows the unapproachable glory and holiness of Almighty God. A vision or an encounter with divine holiness, I don't care who you are, consisting of the unspeakable purity and glory of God that exposes every fiber of hypocrisy and unconfessed sin and guilt and impurity within instantly, dude, that is going to cause every person to just be on their face going, God, forgive me. And when I, I will assume the same position. And it says in verse 5, the Lord said to me while he's laying there on his face, son of man, mark well. See with your eyes and ear, with your, hear with your ears all that I say to you concerning all the ordinances. Mark well who can enter this house and who can't, who can come in and who can come out. This is an emphatic command, mark well, that is saying to give full attention to both visually and audibly everything concerning the ordinances of the house of the Lord, the temple. The ordinances, that speaks of the barriers and the limitations and the restrictions that will be put in place in that holy temple. The laws, verse 5, speaks of instructions and directions that will be given to govern the practices and the activities that will be taking place in this future millennial temple. Specifically, Mark well, verse 5 says, those who can come in and go out from the sanctuary. The things that he is to mark well or that he is to give full attention to here in this vision, he was then to make known these things to these exiled uh, Jews there in Babylonian captivity. You tell them these things. Listen carefully to my instructions, Ezekiel. And as he says in verse 6, now say to the rebellious. So say to those who were, who were sitting there under judgment. I mean, it's not, not like God just coddles them either, you know. I mean, he tells this is what, you know, your sin costs. Say the rebellious to the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord God, O house of Israel, let us have no more of your abominations. It's like your little kid is on time out, you know, and you're disciplining them. Now, I'm not going to have any more of your naughtiness, okay? That's what God is saying here. When you brought in foreigners, uncircumcised in heart and uncircumcised in flesh, to be in my sanctuary and defile it in my house, and you offered my food, the fat and the blood, it broke my covenant because of your abominations. Now note, you know, just as a side note, note the Trinitarian reference in verse 6. Thus says the Lord God, let us have no more of your abominations. That's not coincidental. Plural pronoun. There's hundreds of such offhand remarks here in the Bible. You know, well, that's interesting. God uses a plural pronoun for himself. Boy, he does that a lot in the Bible. 
So he says there, the abominations referred to here have to do with bringing foreigners, verse 7, specifically uncircumcised foreigners of heart and flesh, bringing them in to the temple. Now, under Mosaic law, non-Jews were allowed to come and present sacrifices before the true and living God. But what was unacceptable was for foreigners to officiate to, you know, to kill the sacrifices, to officiate in the Lord's temple, which is what is being spoken of here in verse 8. And you have not kept charge of my holy things, but you have set others to keep charge of my sanctuary for you. This is how lazy or, you know, just uh, uninvolved the priests of Ezekiel, Jeremiah's day were, that they just let, you know, non-Jews offer sacrifices. That was the abomination that God is speaking about back in verse 6. Those in charge of the temple of Ezekiel's day, the, the temple that had just been destroyed, they had treated their holy calling as nothing, as worthless. You know, I mean, think of that. We have a holy calling, man, as believers. A lot of Christians, did. I mean, you know, they don't really devote a lot of time into prayer or studying the word i mean they're in all the the great shows and the concerts and everything but dude you know we have a holy calling these people they just treat it as nothing you know allowing non-jews to do the work that was required or privileged there in the temple and thus when it comes to this future temple service it says in verse 9 Thus says the Lord God, no foreigner uncircumcised in heart or uncircumcised in flesh shall enter my sanctuary, including any foreigner who is among the children of Israel. Not only would a non-Jew not be allowed to work in the temple, but they will not be able to enter specific areas of this future kingdom age temple either. This law became enacted by the Jews who rebuilt the temple at the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. You study those books and you see that they were very careful. I mean, they had these prophecies of Ezekiel. And they were very careful, you know, to begin enforcing this immediately. And you can pick that up in Nehemiah and Ezra. You see it held to in the New Testament at the time of Christ and in the book of Acts. Acts 21, the Apostle Paul is charged with bringing uncircumcised Gentiles into the temple area, a transgression that would be ascribed to this command by God to Ezekiel. Previously, I mean, that's what caused the whole uproar there for the Apostle Paul. Previously, foreigners who came in reverence to Israel's God, they were permitted to come in and worship. And you see that as well. That allowance is included in Solomon's prayer that you see in 1 Kings chapter 8 that he prayed for the temple. If some foreigners come, may they be able to come in and worship. But due to this abuse, the abuse that these priests made of their role, greater restrictions are now added, along with a downgraded duty among the Levites and the priests. You see in verse 10, the Levites who went far from me, verse 10 says, when Israel went astray, who strayed away from me after their idols, they shall bear their iniquity. Yet they shall be ministers in my sanctuary as gatekeepers of the house, ministers of the house. They shall slay the burnt offering and the sacrifice for my people, and they shall stand before them to minister to them. Because they ministered to them before their idols and caused the house of Israel to fall into iniquity, Therefore, I have raised my hand in an oath against them, says the Lord, that they shall bear their iniquity, and they shall not come near me to minister to me as priest, nor come near any of my holy things, nor into the most holy place, but they shall bear their shame and their abominations which they have committed. Nevertheless, I will make them keep charge of the temple for all its work and for all that has to be done in it. Now, under Mosaic law, the whole tribe of Levi had been set apart for service to God. Numbers chapter 3, that whole tribe. 
then within the Levitical tribe, they were separated between those who were descendants of Aaron, Moses' brother, and everybody else. The descendants of Aaron performed the actual priestly duties in the sacrificial system. And then three other Levitical families, Gershom, Kohath, Merari, they served in the temple as workers, officers, judges, worship leaders, gatekeepers, but they didn't go near the holy instruments or the holy place, only a high priest. What's described here is a downgrade in the duties of those who are descendants of Aaron, whose negligence in their priestly duties had led to the downfall of the whole nation. Because they had been in that position of leadership, they're held to a stricter judgment, and they are penalized in their coming millennial temple service because they went astray, verse 10 says, after idols. They can minister in the sanctuary, it says, but only as gatekeepers, verse 11 says, and in other less privileged roles. Why? Verse 12 says, because they ministered to them before their idols. This is how far they sunk. They not only weren't ministering to God, they were serving idol worshipers, caused the house of Israel to fall into iniquity. Therefore, I raise my hand in an oath, says the Lord, that they're going to bear their iniquity. Now, James, in his New Testament epistle, says, Let not many of you become teachers, knowing you will receive stricter judgment. James 3.1 There is greater responsibility, there will be greater accountability upon anyone who assumes a position of leadership over God's people. I don't care what age you're in. Here the indication is that the priests were the ones actually leading God's people in their idolatrous practices in Ezekiel's day. They were performing the idolaters' worship for the people, for God's people, that caused Israel to fall into iniquity. It should cause any pastor, any leader, anyone who opens a word and says, thus says the Lord, to you tremble in fear that God is listening and every you know, loose word is going to be taken account of. God swears an oath to them here that they will bear their iniquity. They shall not come near me, verse 13, to minister to me as a priest, nor come near any of the holy things. I mean, what a bummer. It says, nevertheless, I'll, make, I'll let them you know, have some work there, verse 14 says, because there's a lot of work that will be done. Now, again, seeing it as we will have an active role in the duties that will be taking place in this coming millennial kingdom, I get, we'll see these guys, you know, we'll see them, and I'm sure they will serve as a lesson. You see them there, not only of God's judgment, but you think once again, they will stand as an example of God's grace, that they have a place at all in his kingdom, and he lets them serve there at all. There was one line of Levitical tribe, and they are the ones who are elevated. One line who did not give in to non-biblical practices, and they are noted, verse 15, but the priests, the Levites of the son of Zadok, who kept charge of my sanctuary when the children of Israel went astray from me, they shall come near me to minister to me, and they shall stand before me to offer to me the fat and the blood, says the Lord God. They shall enter my sanctuary. They shall come near my table to minister to me, and they shall keep my charge. Now, these are guys, that, again, that, you know, I'm going to like to go meet, you know. They, they held fast, dude. The Mosaic law, at its inception, entrusted the priesthood to Aaron and his sons, Exodus chapter 27. When Aaron died, the high priesthood passed to Aaron's son, Eleazar, Numbers chapter 20. After Eleazar, the priesthood was passed to his son Phineas in Numbers 25, and you see it passed all the way down to the last days of the judges. The priesthood of the Aaronic line was in the hands of a guy named Eli, whose sons were serving even then in this evil manner, if you know your Bible there in the book of Judges. His sons, you know, were just desecrating God's holy service. 
The line of Eleazar continued until the time God put a curse on them, but it continued to the time of King David when the high priesthood was held by two people, Abiathar and Zadok, together. 2 Samuel 8, 17. When Solomon took the throne, Abiathar, the priest from that Aaronic line, he followed David's son Adonijah in an attempted coup, and his priestly line was cut off which left Zadok as the only one loyal to God's chosen king at that time. And the line of Zadok remained in priestly office until the Babylonian takeover. Of all who were in positions of temple service, even at that time, only those of the line of Zadok remained loyal to their duties once again. And look at what it results in. They were faithful to what God gave them, and God gives them you know, a, a position here in his kingdom. They alone shall come near God to offer sacrifices, verse 15 says, in the coming millennial kingdom. Now, there's an interesting variation here, it's very important, from the Mosaic system, where in the Mosaic system, only one high priest was allowed to approach the Lord once a year on Yom Kippur. You notice here, they literally all shall stand before me is the idea in verse 15 but the priests the Levites the sons of Zadok who kept the charge when the children of Israel went astray they all shall come near me to minister to me that which was the privilege of the high priest and they shall enter my sanctuary so all they all of them is the idea Verse 16, they shall all come near my table to minister to me. They shall all keep my charge. And it shall be whenever they enter the gates of the inner court, verse 17, that they shall put on linen garments. No wool shall come upon them while they minister within the gates of the inner court or within the house. They shall have linen turbans on their heads, linen trousers on their bodies. They shall not clothe themselves with anything that causes sweat. It's going to be an easy task. When they go out of the outer court to the outer court of, to the people, they shall take off their garments in which they have ministered, leave them in the holy chambers, put on other garments, and in their holy garments, and they shall not sanctify the people. Do not dwell amongst them. These priests shall serve as mediators between Israel and God in the same fashion as those in the Old Testament priesthood. Their priestly garments described when they enter the inner courtyard, when they enter, they shall be wearing these light garments of linen. It's going to be just a blessed, easy time, easy time of serving the Lord. Nothing like wool that would cause them to sweat or perspire. They will, they will leave their heads covered with turbans, it says, verse 18. And when they leave the temple courtyard, the, that inner court, verse 19, they will first go to the side buildings. If you remember, that was described in chapter 42, verse 14. It's called the holy chamber here. It's where they would go and they eat and they have their dressing room and all of that. They shall change their clothing before going to the outer courtyard where all the other people are hanging out. And verse 20 says, They shall neither shave their heads nor let their hair grow long, but they shall keep their hair well trimmed. No priest shall drink wine when he enters the inner court. They shall not take as wife a widow or a divorced woman, but take virgins of the descendants of the house of Israel or widows of a priest. And they shall teach my people the difference between the holy and the unholy and cause them to discern between the unclean and the clean. In controversies, they shall stand as judges and judge it according to my judgments. They shall keep my laws, my statutes, and all my appointed meetings, and they shall hallow my Sabbaths. So here, other kinds of external physical aspects this coming priesthood is described the way they wear their hair. It will be well trimmed, so there will be someone serving as a barber in there to the Zadok priests, obviously, and they'll be getting their hair cut every day. No wine will be drank while on duty in the inner court. 
And again, there's a slight differentiating here between this and mosaic system. Again, it's very slight, but very important. The marital restriction given in verse 22, when it says that the priest shall not marry anyone other than a virgin from Israel or a widow of another priest. According to Leviticus 21, that restriction was exclusive to the high priest alone. Here the restrictions upon all the priests. So, you know, there's no distinctions being made as far as priests and high priests, which is because there will be only one great high priest when this coming thousand-year reign of Christ takes place. Now, Ezekiel didn't know that. Ezra and Nehemiah, nobody knew that until Christ came. Now there is a great high priest. He already sits enthroned at the right hand of the Father. But see, it's, if there were provisions being made here for a high priest, then you'd have some problems. But all of this fully harmonizes with everything that transpired since Ezekiel's time. It's amazing as you put it all into place. You know, it's not like, wait a minute, you know, isn't Jesus the great high priest? Yes, he is. That's why there's a differentiating here, very slight but if you know your word and you study, you realize, yeah, dude, there's nothing for high priest in this because Jesus is not only king, he is high priest, he is ruler of all. And so as far as the priest dealing with the people, verse 23, it says, And they shall teach my people the difference between the holy and the unholy, cause them to discern between unclean and, and clean, in controversies, they shall stand as judges and judge amongst the people. They'll keep the laws, make sure everything's being done appropriately. So the role of the priest in the past was that of intermediary. They would serve before God for the people in offering sacrifices and petitions, and they would go to the people on behalf of God. That is presently the duty that has been entrusted to us as the church. We are called a kingdom of priests. We as the church, it's why our times of prayer are so necessary. Mm -hmm. It's why you know, I'm thankful to be amongst believers who get that and, and realize, I don't care if they, how, how many people it is or whatever, but that is our job. We are those who come before God on behalf of this fallen world around us what we're to be doing and then we go to the people with the word of God and with the good news it's what the priests did amongst Israel they are the example we do it now when the church is raptured that will come back upon Israel in the coming millennial kingdom these priests will have that duty once again according to this their intermediary function will be fourfold they will educate the people in fundamental principles of God's holiness, verse 23. What is holy, what is profane, as well as practical application of that. How to discern between unclean and, and clean, verse 23 says. Secondly, they will arbitrate justice, verse 24, judging between people's controversies according to God's judgments. Thirdly, these priests will be in charge of regulating the times of the different feasts that will take place in that day. The appointed meetings, verse 24 calls them, and I'm sure those are going to be incredible times of feasting, worship, and praising the Lord. Imagine, you know, just how the times, uh, the appointed meetings will be in that day. It's not going to be some somber event. There's going to be just incredible rejoicing. And finally, the priest will be in charge of hallowing or consecrating God's Sabbath, his holy rest times, making sure that the Sabbaths are kept precisely. Now, after the flood, the times were changed because the earth went under severe, you know, changes it just in its physical structure. The earth itself had been changed. So times were changed. It makes you wonder if there's going to be similar changes. There seems to be passages that allude to similar changes after the tribulation period. You think, you know, if the earth is going to wobble like a drunken man, if the earth's rotation is interrupted at all, which is the indication, that will change how long days are. 
which will change a lot of other things. You know, if a day is now 25 hours, you know, I mean, think of how what's going to take place. These guys are going to be making sure everything comes into accordance with how things will be during the kingdom age. They will make sure special days and Sabbaths are being kept to everything recognized. It says in verse 25 that and they shall not defile themselves by coming near a dead person only for a father or mother or son or daughter for brother unmarried sister may they defile themselves after he is cleansed they shall count seven days for him and on the day that he goes to the sanctuary to minister in the sanctuary he must offer his sin offering in the inner court says the lord god so here's a regulation for how to deal with a dead body for these priests. A general instruction in verse 25 is the same as it is for priests in Leviticus chapter 21, if you care to cross-reference that. According to Leviticus 21.11, the high priest couldn't go near a dead body, even his own parents. Here, to maintain no distinctions between high priest, priest, in the coming kingdom age, cleansing is prescribed, which includes a seven-day waiting period, on top of which there will be required offering. So all the priests, to all, all the priests, any of them, there's no distinction of a high priest. All the priests will have the same stringent rules. There'll be no exclusion for one person. And finally, as far as their diet, it says in verse 28, it shall be in regard to their inheritance that I am their inheritance. You shall give them no possession in Israel, for I am their possession. They shall eat the grain offering, the sin offering, the trespass offering. Every dedicated thing in Israel shall be theirs. The best of all first fruits of any kind and every sacrifice of any kind from all your sacrifices shall be the priests. Also, you shall give to the priest the first of your ground meal to cause a blessing to rest on your house. The priest shall not eat anything, bird or beast, that dies naturally or was torn by wild beasts. We're going to see in further passages here that there's going to be land allotments given to the nation of Israel. But these sons of Zadok will not receive any property. God is their inheritance. He is their possession, verse 28. And so their food is going to come from the offerings and the sacrifices that will be brought there into the worship center. To the individual Israelite, it's said in verse 30 that they are to bring their first fruits to every kind to support this worship. Every sacrifice, the first of all they have, will be given to the service of the worship of the Lord so as to cause a blessing to rest upon them. And the priests then, it just finishes out, the priests are not to eat any roadkill, okay? And so no, nothing that keels over or is killed by another animal. You know, you don't eat anything like that. And thus will be the priestly service in this future age. And so as we go and we are serving there, we can see and understand what, how things are operating and it maybe have a role in helping it do so. We'll pick up in chapter 45. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, God, for just giving us these instructions ahead of time that we can study your word, we can know what awaits, and we can be preparing for it, God. We can be preparing now, serving faithfully now, Lord so that there will be a faithful a service for us in that day. And not missing out, God, is going to be such great opportunities. Your presence there, God, if being in your presence now, when, God, you are not directly here, your Shekinah glory, but you are amongst us by your Holy Spirit. But, God, what will it be like in that day? It's going to be amazing. God, I don't want to miss out on any of it. So please, God, cause your word dwell richly within us, cause us to live according to it, and to serve you, God, with all our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs>
What a beautiful promise, Lord, that nothing can snatch us out of your hands, Lord, that we get to be in your presence for all eternity, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Bless this prayer time, Lord. Be the pray that your spirit would lead and give us uh, just lead our prayers, Lord. Let those prayers be fervent and effectual, Lord. I pray. Amen. Let's gather together in prayer. <laughs> 